Greetings, everyone. Uh, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the study of Jesus in the Gospels. In this lecture, we are going to look at how Luke treats Jesus' death. We already looked in some detail at the way that Mark, and largely in the in in the same lead as Mark, Matthew, understood the je- the death of Jesus to be a salvific event. Now we want to look at Luke's treatment of Jesus' death. And we can, in some ways, frame Luke's unique treatment by starting with what seem to be pretty clear Lucan theological convictions. So one, and none of these is terribly controversial, and some are even kind of obvious. Luke, like almost all early Christians, virtually by definition, thinks that Jesus is the source of salvation, broadly conceived. Luke thinks that salvation entails repentance. That is, Luke, like most other early Christians, can't imagine someone being saved or, you know, receiving the grace and goodness of God without that entailing a concomitant turn toward God on the human's part. Salvation also involves forgiveness of sins. This is a prominent theme throughout the Gospel of Luke. And salvation entails something we might call wholeness, to use the oft-quoted Hebrew word shalom, a sense of overall human well-being, human flourishing. So it's not just that sins are forgiven, but also that the blind are given sight, the lame are made to walk, the poor are reintegrated into society, and so on and so forth. Most of this is clear enough that I won't say too much about it, but we'll just note that importantly, apropos of the question of Jesus' death, all of these things involving salvation are made available through Jesus in his life, which is to say that during his lifetime, he is offering and achieving repentance for people with parables of repentance, with uh, proof of repentance in the case of someone like Zacchaeus. He is offering forgiveness to everyone who will listen. He's telling parables about how people must forgive each other. He's telling people to pray for forgiveness from their heavenly father, as if to say forgiveness is available, ask for it offer it. And just to state something that maybe isn't stated often enough, Jesus doesn't say, "Uh, Father, forgive us our transgressions, and then add, and this will be metaphysically possible when the Son of God offers the full and meet substitutionary atonement on your behalf. But until that moment, God will be unable to be just and justify the unrighteous. He doesn't add any sort of metaphysical clauses suggesting it's difficult for God to offer forgiveness. He just says, God's ready to forgive. You need to ask for it. You need to offer it to each other. And there are any number of ways that the sort of wholeness or restoration at images of human flourishing are achieved in and through Jesus' ministry. So he's making the sick well. And beyond that, in the wake of his death and resurrection, a community begins to to, to grow, and there's no one needy among them. And there's a sense of joy among the believers. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, all of these, you can see, I hope we're trying to frame a problem, almost call into question, so what's Jesus' death have to do with any of that? Can't Jesus achieve salvation uh, and, and be fully glorified as the source of salvation from Luke's perspective, simply by his teaching, his example, the community he founds, and so on and so forth. We're going to add one more Luke in conviction as we try to solve this, address this. Luke is convinced that Jesus' death was written in the scriptures and was, from a theological perspective, necessary. That is to say, for Luke, and he says this lots, this, isn't, this is not a minor theme, It is not an accident or a tragedy that Jesus was killed. It's not like Jesus got hit by a bus. It's not like Jesus got killed because he had one pesky, one pesky disciple who who blew the plan and betrayed him, or because the people were just so rotten. And isn't it a pity? Because it would have been better if he could have lived. Luke, Luke is always confident that Jesus needs to die. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. The one other thing I want to note here that's important for Lucan Christology is that on the whole, for Luke, 
Luke says Jesus must die as a prophet. This is, I'm saying this by way of parenthesis, but it's kind of important. I said before Jesus, uh, Luke portrays Jesus as uh, a new Elijah. And in the whole central portion of Luke, from Luke 9 to 18, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. And that's not an accident that in chapter 9 here, the passage I have quoted, he's turned his face to go to Jerusalem. That's when he starts telling his disciples he has to die. And although he will sometimes say things like this, the Son of Man must die, he tends to say, I'll quote here Luke 13, we're going to Jerusalem for it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. That, by the way, is not strictly speaking true from a biblical, biblical perspective. Prophets die all over the place, but it doesn't matter. From Luke's perspective, why does Jesus have to go to Jerusalem? Because he must die as a prophet and prophets have to die there. Okay, back to the main thread of the story. Jesus' death is necessary. God wants it. It's already inscribed in the prophets. The question then is, what does number three have to do with number one and two? Because it sure seems like you could say Jesus could be the source of salvation and all the things we want that Luke wants to include in the, in the ambit of salvation without Jesus' death contributing much to that end goal. Now, we already know how people as early as Paul, indeed before Paul, made sense of Jesus' death. That is, they used various sacrificial metaphors, not all of which have the exact same mechanics. So they're a little, they're better on the poetry than on, you know, the, the metaphysics perhaps, because, but one way or another, Jesus died according to the scriptures, and he did so as some sort of sacrifice of atonement. Who knows exactly what sort of Old Testament sacrifice they've got in mind, but that's what the death does. And there's Greek and Roman pagan models for that sort of death on behalf of others. This comes to a four in the synoptics, where at the Last Supper, Jesus says, I came to give my life as a ransom for the many. And there he's using the language that is already well known, that of a, someone about to die who doesn't deserve to die, who in a sense has this excess righteousness and can say, you know what, because this isn't a deserved death, spend the excess on behalf of the others. Let my blood atone for them. Let my death ransom them. Second Maccabees does this. Fourth Maccabees does this. That's what the Gospels pick up on. We come to Luke, though, because right here in this same episode, it's the Last Supper, and Jesus is explaining some things that are about to happen, but he gives a very different lesson. In the Last Supper, he says, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, these foolish Gentiles. They think what's great is to be called king or benefactor. Not so with you. You want to be my followers? Be a servant. Look at me. I am the one who has been serving among you. So there's this language of serving that is that it's greater to serve, to, to be the more humble one and to give than it is to be served. But Luke doesn't cash that out in terms of serving with one's life. It's just Luke holding up Jesus' ministry of giving as an example to be emulated. In other words, there's nothing, there's no real interpretation of the death there. So we're still faced with the problem. Now, there's a bit of language about death in Luke and Acts, but we'll note that the forgiveness of sins isn't really connected to Jesus' death in the same way. Now, maybe we're cutting it all a little fine here, but I'll just make the point. In the book of Acts, we get to see what it looks like for Luke to imagine early believers in Jesus to be preaching about him. And they do say there's forgiveness of sins, but they don't say because Jesus died for your sins. That sort of uh, bumper sticker formulation of the gospel, you won't find in the book of Acts. What you'll find in the book of Acts is a rather different way of portraying why salvation is now available in Jesus' name. That is to say, you get baptized, you get, namely, you get baptized into his name, and you get baptized and get forgiveness based on repentance. The, the salvific thing about Jesus, in a sense, in this early preaching in Acts, isn't that he died for your sins, but that 
by his gracious power, he turned people from their wicked ways. So repentance is a necessary component of getting forgiven. You've got to turn. The grace part comes in because God or Jesus does the turning. So here we get a reference to death and resurrection. God raised up his servant. What did God do with his servant? Sent him to you to turn you from your wicked ways, or in fact, did turn you. Acts 5. God raised Jesus to grant repentance for the remission of sins. So again, it's not an atoning death on behalf of others. It's a powerful risen Lord now turning others from wicked ways to good ways. One other way that Luke handles Jesus' death as a martyr is he makes it a model. So Luke does this in all sorts of ways in his second work. He, he, in all, any number of things about Jesus' activity in, in the Gospel of Luke, raising the dead, uh, making the lame to walk, he then has the apostles do in the book of Acts. Well, another thing about Jesus' ministry that he has imitated is Jesus' death. So whereas Jesus says from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Stephen, as the first martyr, says, Jesus, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Whereas Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, Stephen says, Lord, do not count the sin against them. And all of this, in a sense, can be contrasted with the way that 4th Maccabees plays up a dying martyr, not saying, forgive them, forgive my tormentors, but rather, use my death to save my kinsmen. One more detail before we go on to sort of explain the problem is in the Eucharist, and here we're getting into sort of a finer grained analysis. I'll just mention it and we'll move on. There is a mention of blood in the Eucharistic scene in the Last Supper in Luke. So it's not that there's no mention of sort of Jesus interpreting his death. But even this, I would submit, is somewhat different from an atoning significance. So Luke 22, he took the loaf of bread, he gave thanks and said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Then he took he, then the cup and he said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That's still rather different than saying, this is blood shed for the remission of sins. Jesus says in Luke, it's a covenant in blood. What does that mean? Well, it's important to remember that in the book of Exodus and throughout the Old Testament, covenants are ratified by the shedding of blood. So for Jesus to say, I am opening up for you a new covenant in my death, in my blood, is to say, my death will in inaugurate a new covenant. That might be too subtle a difference, but you can see it, it is not the same as saying my blood is poured out for the remission of sins. I think it would be fair to say the Last Supper focuses more on the notion of this fellowship, this idea of here is a set of meal practices that have included all and sundry throughout my ministry, and these are to be imitated. I give you a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table. There's a sense of continuity between the way Jesus, in his life in Luke, breaks bread with all and sundry and thereby brings in the lost sheep and includes people who were hitherto excluded. And then the way in the book of Acts, they continue to break bread together and include people. Rather different is the way that, say, 1 Corinthians would have um, the idea of eating the bread and drinking the cup tightly connected to Jesus' sacrificial death. Suffice it to say, and I'll quote here one of the foremost scholars of the 20th and early 21st century on Luke Acts, that is Francois Bavon, all agree that Luke rarely confers a soteriological function to the cross. Minds are divided in the explanation of this given. So that's a very judicious summary on Bavon's part. Luke rarely confers. So there are these occasional passages which may be Luke agreeing with early Christian ideas that yes, the death is somehow sacrificial, but he has clearly eliminated a lot of material that interprets Jesus' death as a sacrifice, and he's given it other interpretations. 
So the question then, as Bavon puts it, is that is why, and he says everyone agrees Luke doesn't like that standard interpretation, but no one really agrees why. What's Luke up to? I don't have a full answer to that. No one does. That's Bavon's point. He himself says he doesn't. But I want to note one set of motifs that seem to be working together in Luke's interpretation of Jesus and Jesus as the conduit of God's salvation. And that is that a bit in the way that the Apostle Paul clearly speaks of Jesus as the second Adam or the last Adam, I think Luke is doing something similar. And we'll draw together here a couple, a, a couple details from Luke and then show how they might relate even to Jesus' death. Some of the obvious ways that Luke has um, the story of Adam in his mind as he tells the story of Jesus are uh, something we saw much earlier, and that is in the way he presents the genealogy. He presents Jesus' genealogy backwards, so rather than so-and-so begat so-and-so, he says so-and-so was son of so-and-so. And he goes back in time all the way through the patriarchs like Abraham, all the way back to the really anti old patriarchs, the antediluvians, Enosh and Seth and Adam, son of God. And that sentence continues, or that passage continues, from Adam to God to Jesus, providing a sort of nice symmetry where you get the next son of God, Jesus. And of course, what everyone knows about Adam is that he blew it in the garden. And the first thing we hear about Jesus in Luke chapter 4 is that he's driven by the devil into the wilderness to be tested. And if we think somewhat schematically about the way Adam was tested and failed, Adam was tempted to eat. Adam failed. And the consequence of that was that humankind that was made in God's image they lost that status as the sons of God. Adam ceased to be a son of God in the same way. And the image of God meant to dwell on earth was defaced. And instead of humanity being magnificent, humanity becomes this crippled affair that has to get bread from the earth by the sweat of their brow. Childbearing is painful and there's thorns and thistles and everything's ruined. If we contrast Adam's the nature of his temptation, the nature of his failure, with what happens in the temptation scene in Luke 4, we see Jesus is tempted to eat by Satan, Jesus resists, and Jesus is, in, in a sense, crowned or maintains the status of Son of God. Think even at the level of the questions asked. In Genesis 3-4, Satan questions what God has said to Adam. This, the serpent says, did God say you will die in the day you eat of this? Think of Luke 4. What does God say? God says to Jesus, you are, you are my beloved son. The devil then says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Almost as if to say, you won't die. It's a bit of a stretch here, but you can see a sort of parallel. The devil is almost repeating what he says to Adam. If you're the son of God, surely you won't die. Now, the temptation scene in Luke is paralleled by the temptation scene in Matthew. But Luke has a detail that we don't get in Matthew. After Jesus is victorious, triumphant, resists the devil in these three temptations, in Matthew, it just says the devil left him. And that's the end of the affair. But Luke has a sort of a pretentious and foreboding comment. The devil left Jesus until an opportune time. When is that time? If we're careful readers of Luke, we've got our eyes open the whole way through, and we're saying, when's the devil coming back to try to, to have another go? I think the answer to that question brings us back to our, the main question of this survey, and that is, is it the time of Jesus' death? It's in Gethsemane. And we, when we get to Luke chapter 22, the devil reemerges in a prominent way. Satan went into Judas at the Last Supper. And of course, at the Last Supper is the time that we're dealing with Jesus predicting his own betrayal and death. Luke twenty-two thirty-one. 31. 
Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, Satan has requested to sift all of you like wheat. Jesus is now aware, as he's in the garden, of, of the activity of the devil in some sort of renewed and hostile way. And finally, Luke 22, this is your hour and the authority of darkness. As if to say, we've reached a point in the drama where the devil gets to, gets to sing the tune. Now, what's this going to look like now? If we saw in Luke's temptations that there was a temptation to eat, to, to turn stone into bread, and the devil offers to Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, and Jesus, he, the devil says to Jesus, cast yourself down from the temple and you'll survive. There's a sense in which, and I'm massaging here for the sake of parallelism, Jesus in his first temptation survives a death in Jerusalem. And we could say that the devil leaves Jesus until an opportune time in Jerusalem. Jesus has just gotten back to Jerusalem in the Gospel of Luke when the devil reappears and what's the heart of what he tells Jesus? You don't have to die. Jesus is in the garden. These are unique details to Luke. He was in agonia. Agony, or better in Greek, and agon is a contest, a wrestling match. Jesus is in a wrestling match in the garden. And what's, what's the cry echoing, through, uh, echoing around in the time of the hour of darkness? It is the, mouth, the people as the mouthpiece of Satan saying, save yourself. You don't have to die. Here's the contest. Here's the wrestling match. Jesus is tempted yet again to believe he doesn't have to die. And so as Luke has set it up, we've been told Jesus must die in Jerusalem. He's been trying to steal the apostles for this grim fact all through Luke 9 to 18 as they make their way to Jerusalem. He arrives in Jerusalem and is, and is tempted to think he won't have to die, save yourself, and yet he passes the final test. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, to suggest that the, that the, the motif of, of a new Adam has not disappeared, think of some other unique Lucan details of the way the passion is treated. A unique detail to the Gospel of Luke is, is this conversation with the brigands of, on either side of him. And one says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, paradisos means paradise. It's also the Greek word for garden. And in fact, the word used in Genesis, God planted a paradisos in Eden. In other words, to paraphrase and to sort of flesh out the hypothesis here, or the, the thesis I'm putting forward, what if Jesus is saying here on the cross to the thief beside him, I just defeated the devil once and for all, and I was successful in being obedient to my father. I said, your will be done. I did not save myself. I was obedient, and therefore, the garden from which we were excluded, the garden from which Adam was cast out, it's open again. Today we're going back in. Victory is ours. I'll give a Jewish a passage from a Jewish text of about this time to show how a different Jewish author was using the same constellation of images. So this is from a text called the Testament of Levi, Levi being one of the ten, 12 patriarchs, and they're predicting some sort of Messiah figure, a savior figure, and look at all the points familiar from Luke. This savior figure, the Testament of Levi says, will open the doors of paradisos, of the garden, and will remove the old threatening sword against Adam, and shall give to the saints to eat from the tree of life, and the spirit of holiness shall be on them, and Beliar shall be bound, Beliar is a name for the devil, and he shall give his power to the... His, he shall give his power to his children to tread on evil spirits. Think of how many of those motifs, I'm not saying Luke has this passage in view, but if that's one way a Jewish author imagines a savior figure reversing all the things that went wrong with Adam, think of the way Luke has done something arguably similar. 
Jesus from the cross says we're getting back into paradisos. Jesus, as a result of his death and resurrection, offers his followers the Holy Spirit, like the Testament of Levi is the spirit of holiness. Jesus proclaims triumphantly to his, his, his followers in Luke 11, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He is bound. And he tells them, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. You get a picture of Jesus being victorious over the devil. This is the motif sometimes called Christus Victor. Now, to show away another Christian author unpacks this, we get the new Adam motif, as I said earlier, explicit in Paul. And the important thing about the new Adam motif, when, when Jews or Christians are thinking about a savior figure along these lines, what made things wrong in the Adam story was that someone disobeyed. And the way things need to be made right is by obedience. So I think it's kind of hard for a lot of Western Christians who have so much of the idea in their mind that the problem is guilt and what is needed is forgiveness or uh, substitutionary atonement. It's hard to remember there's another way to think of the problem. If the problem is that humanity is under a curse because of disobedience, what they need is an act of obedience to undo the curse. That's exactly how Paul thinks of Jesus' death. In fact, it's not so much a death as an act of righteousness. One man's trespass led to condemnation for all. There's the problem. So one man's act of righteousness leads to justification for all. One man disobeys, the other man obeys, and the result of the obedience is that everyone is made righteous. With that sort of language in mind, think even of one more Lucan distinctive, and that is what the centurion says who sees Jesus killed. You recall that in the Gospel of Mark, he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. In the Gospel of Luke, he says, truly, this man was righteous, was just, was innocent. You could see then that what I'm proposing is if Luke has some of this model, if he's taking some inspiration from the story of Adam's fall, he can tell the story of Jesus' death as one of radical obedience to the Father, an obedience so pure that Jesus defeats the devil, robs the devil of his old power, opens the doors to paradise, and he dies as someone righteous, as an act of obedience, and that's what sets things right. That's not technically in mutual contradiction to notions of sacrificial atonement, but it is a different set of emphases, and I think it would go some way toward addressing Bavon's question of why has Luke downplayed the soteriological significance or function of the cross? Well, it's that Luke sees a new humanity begun in Christ, and he fits Jesus' obedient death on the cross into that story of Jesus as the new Adam and as the life giver and the bringer of salvation, qua new Adam.